Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 11, May 31st to June 6th, 1861. And first and foremost, I hope everyone had a happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Before we get started, last week we talked about some motivations and armaments for the men who will be fighting our war. This week, we will continue in some smaller scale actions. First, I think it is important we visit again with Benjamin Butler and bring up the contraband issue. Let's begin by checking back with our friend from Baltimore, the guy who voted for Jefferson Davis for president 57 consecutive times, Benjamin Butler. Butler had taken command of Fortress Monroe, still in the hands of the federal government near Hampton, Virginia. You actually see it if you have ever driven to Virginia Beach via that terrible tunnel that, for some reason, always has traffic around and through it. It's somehow unavoidable, no matter what time of day you drive there. But I digress. Anyway, Butler was aware of the Confederate presence in the area. The battery we mentioned at Sewell's Point was being constructed within range of Fortress Monroe. While he was aware that the Confederates were making that position so as to fire upon him, what he may not have been aware of was that the construction of the battery was being done by slaves lent to the Confederate Army. And this would actually be a common uh, practice throughout the war that uh, local owners, farmers, uh, would lend their services uh, for the war effort. So that's something that continues to happen. Three of these slaves, actually owned by one of the commanders of the Virginia militia, would make their escape and arrive at Fort Monroe. Butler would receive them all and interrogate them for intelligence on the enemy and their positions. Now, the Confederate militia colonel would send a fellow officer under a white flag to Butler. They would argue that under the fugitive slave law, that the three men in question should be returned to their owner. Butler was a good lawyer and would argue that since the Confederate states had declared themselves to be their own country, he would not have to abide by the law and refused their return. Butler was quoted as saying the following, I mean to take Virginia at her word, as declared in the Ordinance of Secession passed yesterday. I am under no constitutional obligations to a foreign country which Virginia claims to be. Butler would further argue that they were contraband of the enemy. This is important because, as we have already mentioned, the aim at the beginning of the conflict was not to free the slaves, but it would become increasingly apparent that the slave labor, especially you know as, as they're being lent to the Confederate war effort, was a big part of uh, you know sustaining the Confederacy. There were a variety of feelings on the institution as discussed last week. Some were abolitionists, some were not, but converted to the idea. And I do think that Benjamin Butler is a great example of that. you know he was a Democrat. As mentioned earlier here, he voted for Jefferson Davis for president, um, but now he's sort of coming around to this idea. Freeing the slaves would be a part of the northern war effort that would be seen as necessary uh, in hampering the Confederacy. Now, when we say contraband, we are not likening the escapees to property, an argument that had many abolitionists at the time angry at Butler, uh, because he had you know, called them contraband. Contraband would become a synonym for freedom or a free man in that time. Many more escaped slaves would seek sanctuary at Fortress Monroe soon thereafter. Now we mentioned previously that the Union forces had successfully made a foothold on Virginia soil, taking the key railroad town of Alexandria. Confederate forces had not challenged the crossings, and any captured were released in exchange for the town. It's easy to look at maps these days, or maybe even play games like Total War with a bird's eye view of the situation, and have a misconception about how easy it is to understand the movements and positions of your enemy. During the Civil War, cavalry would often be used to scout and probe and gather important intelligence. 
Cavalry could also be used to screen movements as well, but I would like to get into tactics in a later episode. Brigadier General David Hunter would wish to gather intelligence on the Confederate positions at a place called Fairfax Courthouse in Northern Virginia. He would order cavalry under the command of one Lieutenant Tompkins to gather information on the enemy positions on May 31st, 1861. Just as a quick aside, I would like to introduce a couple of figures. General Hunter at this point is serving in the Army of Northeastern Virginia, which is going to be commanded in the field by Urban McDowell. McDowell had come uh, to command the army but through some connections via his patron, Salmon P. Chase, and received a generalship at the start of the war. Prior, he had attended the U.S. Military Academy and served in the Mexican-American War as a de camp to General Wool. Despite being a professional soldier, he had not commanded troops in the field prior to the Civil War. This lack of experience will be important leading up to the uh, Battle of First Bull Run. David Hunter is another interesting individual as well. He had attended West Point and served in the Seminole War and Mexican-American War as well. Being stationed in Kansas prior to Fort Sumter, he would write letters gaining the ear of President Lincoln, who rewarded him with a command. At this point, early in the conflict, he will be the fourth highest ranking volunteer officer. Hunter was a strong abolitionist and advocated heavily for the use of black troops in the army. Later in the war, he would begin their enlistment and issue General Order No. 11 without authorization that emancipated slaves in several southern states. The order would be rescinded, but a proper emancipation proclamation would follow not long after. While we are doing a few introductions here, commanding the Confederate forces is Richard Ewell. At this point, a colonel, but will become an important general for the Army of Northern Virginia. During the Mexican-American War, you will be promoted to captain for gallantry. In May, he had resigned his commission to join the Confederate forces. You would rise through the ranks and eventually, spoilers, take over for Jackson later in the war. This is where he will be involved in one of the more debated controversies of the war during the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, but we will certainly cover that, so do not worry. Back to the night of the 31st. Cavalry under Tompkins would surprise the only two Confederate sentries posted on the road to Falls Church, where the Federals had been camped. Facing the Union men were two units of cavalry and one of infantry, the Warrenton Rifles, commanded by John Marr. It was 3 a.m. when the cavalry had moved in on Fairfax Courthouse, so there was much confusion in the darkness. Many of the Confederates rode away. The Warrenton Rifles would form a line in a field and fire at their own riders as they were thundering past, wounding one man. The Union cavalry would exchange fire with the rifles, uh, killing Captain Marr in the process. There is some confusion as to whether Marr had challenged the Union cavalry or had ridden forward to find a better position, uh, but no matter what the case was, his body was recovered the following day. This was the first Confederate fatality in the war. Richard Ewell, would also be wounded as the Union cavalry fired sporadically throughout the town. A former governor of Virginia, William Smith, would assume command of the rebels and form a new defense against the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. William Smith was actually known as Extra Billy from his days running a passenger and mail stagecoach line, where he would add extra routes to his services, which, of course, uh, you know, resulted in extra fees, since hence the name Extra Billy there. Along with a governorship, William Smith also served as a senator and congressman for Virginia. In 1849, he had moved to California, you know, most, most likely in result of the gold rush there, you know, we talked about that, uh, and his son went missing uh, for a very prolonged period of time uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, he actually formed a private crew to search for him and went all the way to China, but couldn't actually find him. It was not successful. On June 1st, Smith gathered uh, not only Confederate soldiers, but also uh, some civilians who decided to pitch in and help. And together, they were able to uh, defeat the Union cavalrymen who were repulsed back north. Several had been captured and wounded 
On both sides, Mar and a trooper were both killed. This is an interesting early skirmish of the war, and it does help the Confederate uh, masking of their built-up in their nearby Manassas Junction, which will be the site of our first major battle of the war, as already mentioned. On June 3rd, we would have another engagement, but it would be a great place to introduce another big figure of the war in George B. McClellan. George Brenton McClellan will be born to a prominent family in Philadelphia in 1826. After attending West Point, he would serve as an engineer in the Mexican-American War, where he was praised for his capabilities in that role. After the war, McClellan would observe French and British forces during the Crimean War, as well as have a general tour of Europe. In addition to writing a new manual on cavalry, he would develop a new saddle. The McClellan saddle would actually be used by the U.S. Cavalry uh, until horses were actually deemed uh, obsolete. So it is a very sturdy saddle that is used for some period of time, pretty much all the way up until World War I. In 1857, the inventor of the saddle would resign his commission to move into railroading, where he would excel and very quickly become a vice president of a railroad company. During this time, filibuster groups would seek him for his military prowess. You know, remember, we talked about William Walker and his expedition, additional expeditions to, say, Cuba uh, and other you know, Central American uh, states there. At the outbreak of the war, he would become a major general in charge of Ohio volunteer troops. He was second only to Winfield Scott himself. As we'll see in our future episodes, McClellan is one of the most criticized figures of the war. While his men loved him, referring to the general as Little Mac, or the Young Napoleon, battlefield success would elude him. Some say he had some sort of psychological issues, and also that he had little to no friends, and was disliked by those in power. And while it is true that McClellan would not get along with Edwin Stanton, uh, for one, and there is a famous story of how he simply goes to bed after attending a wedding, even though uh, he was informed that President Lincoln was waiting for him, uh, a story that may very well be untrue, or at least um, there are uh, could be exaggerated, I suppose, uh, for uh, propaganda purposes, but uh, it is a little bit comical to think that um, Abraham Lincoln is sitting uh, sort of in your uh, uh, waiting room, your your drawing room there, and uh, McClellan walks in and just goes straight to bed and then has to send somebody down to tell uh, Lincoln that, uh, by the way, I'm too tired, you're going to have to go home. So I, I suppose it is a little bit of a comical uh, uh, scene there. So for stories like that and this general bad rap that uh, McClellan gets, it's pretty easy for us to root uh, against him, you know, especially because he does come from a prominent family. Uh, you have underdogs like Lincoln, Sherman, Grant. Those are all folks who had humbler beginnings as opposed to Little Mac. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll see if we can come to our own conclusions here uh, as we move forward, uh, and maybe we'll have a little bit of a wrap on McClellan where we can we can really flesh that out. So uh, just stay tuned. McClellan would be tasked with the protection of the Baltimore and Ohio Railway, which would be important even in the capturing of Richmond. Under his command were troops from not only Ohio, as we mentioned, but also uh, Indiana and Western Virginia, uh, those who had been against secession. The majority of the troops were from Ohio, though. The um, reason being is that if there was a new West Virginian territory, then they would no longer share a border with the Confederate state and save them from being a battleground. So that was certainly some motivation for uh, folks from Ohio. Union commanders had received intelligence that relatively untrained recruits of Confederates had formed at Philippi uh, under Colonel George Porterfield. In response to the destruction of part of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, uh, the Union would move forward uh, and set up a plan to attack the enemy. Colonel Benjamin Kelly devised a plan to attack the Confederates in a move called a double envelopment. A double envelopment would be attacking the enemy on both flanks or sides. 1,600 troops under Kelly and another 1,400 under Colonel Ebenezer Dumont uh, 
would attack from two sides of the rebel camp, which included somewhere around 800 men. The start would be signaled by a pistol shot. A local actually sympathetic to the southerners actually discharges a pistol uh, when her son was apprehended by the Yankees while attempting to warn the men under Porterfield. Uh, so it has a little bit of a uh, false start there. So I guess we can say. Despite the setback, the Confederates had failed to post any pickets and so were taken completely by surprise. They would soon be in flight, running 50 miles away, hence the name often given to the Battle of the Races at Philippi. Now this is considered to be the first organized land action of the war, although casualties were light on both sides. It was significant for two more reasons. Early in the conflict, any sort of action, no matter how small, was given a lot of publicity. You know, we don't have uh, a crystal ball to see in the future, so we can't see that there's going to be uh, much larger engagements, much more casualties, you know, much more important to uh, the, the war effort. So uh, any kind of engagement, uh, you know, especially when we're thinking that it's going to be a short war, right, uh, it's going to be important. So going to be a lot of publicity around it. And especially in the western part of Virginia, uh, it's going to be a good traction point for the separation of that territory from the main state of Virginia. The second reason that uh, Philippi is important is that it does start the career, uh, or at least the Civil War career, I should say, um, of George B. McCon. Uh, he's going to gain fame following Philippi despite facing green and numerically inferior foes. It should also be pointed out that McClellan had not yet arrived in western Virginia at the time of the battle, and uh, so the plan was concocted and executed by Benjamin Kelly. So McClellan isn't even there, um, but it is uh, his command, so he, he arrives after, and uh, he's going to get credit for it. Kelly had received a wound to the chest that was originally thought to be fatal, uh, but he would recover. As mentioned, and will be mentioned in a future episode, there were Western Virginian forces fighting for the Union. And as mentioned, uh, this action would help push the eventual formation of the state of West Virginia. So Philippi is important for uh, a small handful of reasons, uh, despite probably that we have never heard of it if, if we're a casual uh, uh, Civil War historian there, right? The writer Ambrose Bierce was president at the battle, and in his short story, On the Mountain, he writes the following about Philippi. We had been in action, too, had shot off a Confederate leg at Philippi, the first battle of the war, and had lost as many as a dozen men at Lower Hill and Carrick's Ford, whither the enemy had fled in trying, heaven knows why, to get away from us. So, it is a very poetic way of saying that both sides are very green. June 3rd, 1861, we'll actually see the departure of someone who played a small part in our early story and honestly, in my opinion, helped to launch Honest Abe to the presidency. Stephen Douglas would contract typhoid and die the same day as the races at Philippi. He had fallen ill after a speaking tour to build up support for defense of the Union. It is interesting to think about his stance on this classic debate of state versus federal rule. It's also weird to think that if you said, let the people rule today, no one would really bat an eye. Uh, but back then, it was certainly was, and connected with this issue, very, uh, very hot button topic, right? How different things may have been if Douglas was elected. Uh, we can Something else we can also think about. But alas, we do have to say goodbye to Stephen Douglas, who um, does do his part in helping Abraham Lincoln before uh, he, he catches typhoid there. So, goodbye, Stephen Douglas. This first week of June would see the early raiding actions of the Confederate privateer CSS Savannah. It was a brief career, only making one capture before having the tables turned by the USS Perry just the second day out at sea. The entire crew was taken prisoner after a running fight and sent back to New York. Thirteen men would be placed on trial for piracy, which outraged the South, certainly. We mentioned this in an early episode, but the United States had considered the actions of the South uh, as insurrection, of course, and thus the raiding of commerce vessel is criminal. 
In response, the Confederate government would issue a statement that for any of the privateers killed, they would kill Union prisoners and release of the names of those who were going to be paying that price, which pushed uh, pressure on the U.S. government. It was a tough situation. The Lincoln administration could give legitimacy to the rebels uh, if it uh, did not execute these these folks. There's been, essentially, you're saying it's not an insurrection, um, so it gives sort of legal ground, gives ground for the Confederacy to go back to Europe and say, um, look at this. You know, they're even saying that you know we're we're certainly justified in doing this and in separating from the, from the country, right? Ultimately, though, a path was chosen that would avoid bloodshed, and the Confederate prisoners were uh, not, they were not executed. That should also be noted that the summer of 1861, two more Confederate privateers were launched from Charleston, the Jefferson Davis in June and the Prittle in July. The Jefferson Davis would make nine captures before running aground in Florida. The Prittle would be sighted the first day out of port and engaged by a U.S. frigate, which would put a hole in the hull of the vessel and capture the crew. Let's close out by talking about Confederate commerce raiders, which played a small part in the war, but most likely did not have quite as big an impact as you know, one might think. Because of the lack of industrial capabilities the North had, uh, as compared to the South, the South would uh, have a smaller navy, and rely mostly on blockade runners and commerce raiders. Now, not to get too piratey on everyone, but Jefferson Davis would issue letters of mark. A letter of mark is a license for a private citizen to arm and outfit a vessel for the purpose of raiding enemy merchant ships. AKA, they were allowed to commit acts of piracy that in peacetime would be illegal. Those individuals would be known as privateers, as opposed to, say, pirates, right? So the South would focus on commerce raiding, and thus leaning more toward those kinds of vessels that could be armed to sufficiently overpower merchant vessels, but still also fast so they could outrun the Union blockaders. Confederate naval yards and those of Great Britain uh, would build cruisers that were designed for this purpose. Some would develop a steam engine as well as a sail power uh, that could uh, be effective in, you know, say there is no wind, you use the steam. It can go fast. If there's wind, you use the wind, right? Privateering had the promise of potential large profits, but unfortunately, the Union blockades would limit the ability of the Confederates to sell their wares, and uh, especially to foreign ports, uh, who would also restrict the rebels to only purchasing uh, supplies and also making repairs. Arriving to these foreign ports would gain notoriety to the Confederate cause, if nothing else, and the Union would expend resources on attempting to catch the raiders. Uh, ultimately, though, a lot of would-be privateers and, and uh, Confederate citizens who uh, start off as privateers will switch to blockade running, which would be a more profitable venture, so there won't be as many raiders uh, throughout the war. I hope to cover more of the Navy's uh, in later episodes, probably go a little bit more in depth than this, uh, but uh, this is a good idea of what's going on, at least early, with these privateers. That's going to do it for today. We actually covered a lot in our brief time. We had two small scale battles in Virginia and uh, Western Virginia. It's soon going to be West Virginia, right? Benjamin Butler came back again uh, so soon, too, right? So we feel like we just were introducing Benjamin Butler. We also talked about the Confederate privateers and commerce raiding that will continue even further. While we have this week the first organized land action, next week we will have the first pitched battle. A lot of firsts, that is for sure, so let's get excited. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be welcomed and appreciated. Once again, feedback is also welcome and appreciated. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, more than welcome. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great week.